Thank you so much, Chris, for being with us today. I'm excited to welcome our guest today, Dr. Christopher Morphew, a distinguished academic figure currently serving as the Dean of the School of Education at Johns Hopkins University. That is a, we have a lot of global audience today, I see from Uganda to Qatar. So this is a, I, I hope you've heard of Johns Hopkins. I bet you have globally recognized institution known for its commitment to research, learning and fostering innovation. My own kids went through their Center for Talented Youth back in the day when they were kids, Chris. Dr. Morphew's extensive background in education, research and policy has positioned him at the forefront of education reform, guiding pivotal changes to enrich learning experiences and outcomes. Under Chris's leadership, the School of Education is driving advancements in educational practices with an emphasis on evidence-based strategies to address contemporary challenges in the education sector. His leadership at the Office of Education Reform illustrates Chris's unwavering commitment to shaping an inclusive and equitable educational landscape conducive to lifelong learning and development. Chris, welcome. Thanks, David. Uh, glad to be here. A lot of your work today, Chris, is on, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, state policies and governance, but a lot of your past research is on how colleges and universities market themselves. The topic really is focused on higher education today for the most part. And I think for us in America and probably around the world as well, a lot of people have two big questions. Why is it so expensive to go to university today? And should I pay the amount they're asking getting into the student debt that I'm taking on? So I'm not saying those are the only topics today, but let's start with either of those. Chris, take your pick. Well, I could start with um, why it's so expensive. And, and you know, we've got an international audience. So I would, I would point out that in some parts of the world, it's not expensive at all. It's free. Uh, there are many countries around the world, in Western Europe and other other parts of the world, where uh, governments and uh, society has decided that higher education is going to be free. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. Uh, in the United States, there are a number of factors that contribute uh, to the high cost uh, and the growing high cost of of higher education. I think chief among those are, are two or three I would point out to the audience. We could certainly delve more into those if, if you'd like. One would be um, the primacy of labor. We spend the vast majority of um, our, the vast majority of our expenses in higher education are salaries, right? Um, we have not uh, in higher education come up with um, high quality ways of delivering uh, education more efficiently. And uh, the result of that is increased cost. The, the bucket of goods that we buy in higher education is an expensive bucket of goods relative to the bucket of goods that's that we use for things like CPI. And so higher education costs uh, increase faster um, than 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 average costs as well. Um, the other thing I think is the reason it's grown so fast on the public side of the equation is that um, if you look at um, if you look at what, what state governments have been contributing to higher education over time, their share of costs have actually gone down. So starting in the 80s, you've seen a trend line, a negative trend line in terms of states' contributions to what they're spending for higher education and that the the, the increasing costs have been made up by tuition rather than by uh, revenues from, from, from state budgets. And then I think um, third, and this is probably the most interesting, um, there's relatively little incentive uh, to control costs in higher education. In some ways, higher education is priced like no other good. Um, uh, the, the, one of the ways that higher education institutions actually compete um, uh, for students is by demonstrating that they spend more per student, that they are actually uh, more, relatively inefficient compared to their peers. Um, so, so an intriguing thing you'll see in higher education view books or websites or whatever else is we actually have fewer students per faculty member than that other university, right? We are actually more inefficient. And the, what they're saying to you is we're spending more on your education. We're spending more on the co-curricular activities. We're spending more on the facilities. We're spending more on our faculty salaries. We're spending more on all these things. And that should translate as, at least as a proxy um, uh, for quality. Um, and then the second question you asked, uh, you had asked, uh, uh, David was, should I, you know, uh, um, should I, should I, um, should I uh, plan to spend, I think, what the price tag of the institution that, that my son or daughter is, is, is looking at it. I think the, the answer to that is in, in the, in the majority of cases in the United States, price tag is not what you're going to end up paying. And, and that is part of the, the confusion, I think, around the cost of higher education as well. Uh, uh, 
knowing what you're paying for and understanding what the actual price tag is in higher education is a confusing um, confusing process that um, you only learn about as a result of going through it. And I'm sure I'm not even sure going through it um, helps you learn about it. Um, it's opaque. We don't do a good job in higher education historically of explaining what it is you're actually paying for, um, where your dollars are going, and what are the sources of financial aid, and what are the different kinds of financial aid that one might use to attend uh, an institution or a college. And the fact that financial aid can come from the from from the federal government, it can come from the state government, it can come from a scholarship organization, it can come from institutional discounting, right? It can come from athletic scholarships, all these other kinds of things. It's a it's a confusing. Um, process that is that is in in the United States in particular very hard to understand. So that opacity makes it really hard to be confident in our decisions. When we walk mm -hmm. into Walmart, we see the price tag on the shelves of each of the products there. Mm -hmm. uh, when we apply for a university, as you're pointing out, Chris, I guess the good news is there are lots of sources of mm -hmm. uh, financial aid. And, that, and that's kind of a blessing, but it, there's also an incentive probably for universities to put up a high number because a bigger price makes you look like you're more serious, you're higher quality. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a weird dynamic where universities want to show as much pricing as they can and yet offer as much the ones that can as much aid as they can. Uh, yeah. So this is all entirely logical to you. Yes. <laughs> um. I think I understand it. I'm not sure I would describe it as I'm, I, I'm not sure I did, would describe it as logical. You know, the, a couple of things you just pointed to. There's a whole literature on price signaling, right? And in higher education, and 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 this is true in some other areas, right? Um, you don't see big sales on Mercedes, right? For for a reason, right? Um, in in higher education, price signaling price signaling is a very important thing, and uh, a high price is a proxy uh, for high quality. Now. Um, what's interesting is that a few institutions in the United States have chosen um, just in the last um, just recently in the last month, I've seen a, a news article about this, have chosen to cut their tuition in half. Um, and wow. they've done this because effectively they were only getting half the tuition from most of the students anyway. Right. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, actually, we're not fifty thousand dollars. Actually, it is going to cost you twenty five thousand to attend. Now, the danger in doing that, of course, is that um, the folks who wanted aid beyond the twenty five thousand dollars are going to be might be uh, uh, um, might be squeezed in that as well. But you're also essentially s saying to the market, um, we're priced at half of what these other institutions are priced and people are going to um, infer things about that. Yeah. Um, so the New York Times recently asked this question in so many words, pretty direct. Uh, is mm -hmm. it the right question? The question, is college worth it? What's your take on that? I think it's the wrong question. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, the New York Times did a there's a daily podcast on this. There's been some pieces in the journal and the Times. It's 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 kind of all the rage now to ask this question. Is college worth it? And I, I just think it's the wrong question. Um when when a student, when uh, when uh, the folks watching this, their sons or daughters, or maybe some of them are prospective college students, when they're when they're choosing to attend um, an institution of higher education, they're not choosing whether to go to college or not. They're choosing to go to a specific institution. And um, this this is, again, part of the confusing thing about the U.S. higher education market. There are four thousand colleges, and universities in the United States by far. Um, the most of, of any country in the world. And there's a great diversity of institutions as well. Again, by far the most diverse system of higher education in the world. We have we have institutions that that historically enrolled black students. We have hist uh, institutions that focus on um, and then enroll a high number of Hispanic students. We have women's colleges. We have men's colleges. We have two-year colleges. We have four-year colleges. For-profit, not-for-profit, you know, run by churches, uh, secular. We have, you know, every 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 kind you can Basically. imagine. Obviously, pu obviously public, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I think the question to ask is not is college worth it because you can run statistics and sort of say in general, yeah, yes, um, going to college in general, if you graduate, will produce an economic dividend if that's what you're interested in that is greater than the than the investment that you've made in 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 higher education, but um, what that general data obscures is the fact that these are very specific, discrete decisions. And for a given student, um, that decision could look very, very different. Um, for example, um, choosing to attend an institution with a with a uh, six year graduation rate below 30 percent. And there are many of those in this country wow. is very likely a bad decision. 
right? Now, you may be one of the three out of 10 students or two out of 10 students who graduates within six years, um, but you're taking a big risk there, right? And um, what you don't want to be is the student who's paid for two or three years of education but doesn't graduate and get that dividend uh, that one receives uh, from, from graduating from college. Uh, so choosing to attend an institution with a low graduation rate, that's a challenge, right? Choosing to attend an institution with a high loan default rate. Uh, these are the things that I would look at. If 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 your son or daughter is looking at an institution, and, and these data are read, readily available at the- That was going to be my question, Chris. This is all stuff that I can find as a parent? Yep. You can find from the federal government. You can find from state loan agencies. Um, two very uh, important things to look at right away is what's the graduation rate? And then what's the loan default rate, Right. Um, if students aren't graduating and if they and if they're defaulting on their loans, those are very bad signs, right? Those are very bad signs. And if if the loan default rate is you know above um, you know two, three, four percent, you've got a real significant issue there in terms of students being able to pay back their loans. And that tells you something something pretty darn pretty darn significant. So there are some data to look at on this um, and to, 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 to understand it sort of a basic threshold from an economic ROI perspective, um, is this likely to be a good investment or not? Chris, um, if you, we have a lot of parents watching, obviously, so we want to speak a little bit more to that right now. Um, I don't know if you've had kids go through college yourself. Have you? Yes, you have. So I, I just I just had one graduate and I've got another who's a junior in college. Yes. All right. Good. So I think we have one of the worldwide experts to help fellow parents out <laughs> to, to ask what what are three things we should have in mind as we tour that university with our child, go through the session where they answer the questions. What's a really smart question we could ask at that session? I'm just asking you for any coaching that we can use to make good decisions. Sure. Sure. And I just saw in the chat, someone's asking, how do we get a teenager to make a good decision? And I can't, I can't help you with that. Let's, <laughs> let's be, let's be real clear. And by the way, that's another part of this confusing process, right? We're asking 17 and 18 year olds to make these, make these really important decisions where, um, where adults, um, who've, 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 you know, gone through college, don't feel equipped to make these decisions. So it's, it's a really muddy and noisy process. Um, and I can tell you, having gone on a lots of college tours with my kids, um, and I'm not the kind of parent that my, that, that uh, a child likes to take on a college tour. I ask a lot of questions. Let's, let's just say that. And I point out, I point out a lot of things. You're that guy um, in the back of the room with his hand constantly <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I would, the things that I'm trying to understand, um, everybody knows their, their kid, right? You, you know, you, you know, whether your child is someone who's likely to get lost um, in a, in a crowd, you know, whether your child is likely to be someone who's going to need um, uh, stronger academic supports, you know, whether your child is someone who's going to need what kinds of peers you're looking for. So I would certainly you know, I would, I would, I would, um, uh, I would, I would acknowledge that parents know better than any expert about about their child, but I can tell you some of the things that I think I would be looking for is, um, uh, I, I I said this to my kids when they were growing up. I, I would never want my child to be um, the smartest kid in his or her class at school. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is there's a and there's a literature on this. There's a there's a peer effect. There's an intellectual and academic peer effect in in higher education, and I think. Most of us, certainly I did, want to find uh, an institution of higher learning where we feel like um, our son or daughter are going to benefit from um, the intellectual aptitude and curiosity of the students that are that are in his or her classes, right? Um, and I sort of joke, you don't want to be the smartest kid in the class, but you really don't. I mean, you want to benefit from that, from what's going on in the classroom. And if you're surrounded by other students who are intellectually curious, right, they've come to college because they want to learn about a broad-based set of subjects, right? Um, that to me is a very good sign. So I would, uh, in addition to paying attention to what they focus on in the tour, I would also focus on who else is on the tour, right? Talk with some of the other parents, get to know some of the prospective okay. students, um, those kinds of things. There's plenty of admission sites, um, that, plenty of websites that have admissions data where you can see, um, you know, average grade point and SAT scores of, of um, uh, the students who get admitted, the students who, are, who yield um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a given college. And I would say, you know, pay attention to those. I don't think they're the end all and be all. And 
you learn less and less and less about that about that as fewer students take SATs and report SATs. That's an important caveat there. But um, I'm looking for a place where my kids are going to be um, where they're going to be challenged. Um, I'm looking for a place where there's some level of ideological diversity, and I don't necessarily mean political diversity, but that's that that could be one example of it. But certainly ideological diversity. Um, I want to see um, leadership on the campus that that um, wants to um, wants to push students to learn. I also want to see, um, quite frankly, given the epidemic of 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 mental health issues on campus, I want to know how this campus handles mental health. Um, right. I want to look at. You can look at. Um, um, among other things, you can look at, uh, 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 there was an act passed a few decades go ago called the Clery Act, and it, the federal government requires institutions to, to report um, crimes on campus. Um, there's, also, there's also data where you can see issues around mental health on campus. That's harder to see. Um, but those are some data points to look at as well. But um, it is quite likely that at some point during his or her tenure, you, that your child is going to need access to some counseling services. Um, what do those counseling services look like? Is the university investing in those areas? What other kinds of mentoring support, peer support is available to, the, to, to your students? How seriously do does this institution invest in advising, uh, both academically and co-curricularly? Um, I think those are very important features. Um, on the student development side of the equation, um, I look at, uh, you know, uh, take a look at what the, who the student affairs staff are and, and where they're trained and, and, and how diverse they are in terms of their thinking about um, the challenges that your son or daughter are likely, um, uh, likely to encounter in college. I think there's a lot of things you can look at. I mean, every college is going to tell you they have 300 clubs and you can start your own. Every college is going to show you their climbing wall. Every college is going to show you their student center. Every college is going to tell you that their faculty really care about you. Um, and for the most part, you know, all those things are true. They have a nice climbing wall. Their faculty do care about you. But I think um, poking a little bit at some of the issues that I just described, is it, it can be useful. That was fantastic. And I was taking notes and my kids are already done. So, but I, I grandkids. Um, so, <laughs> and I really appreciate what Nagesh is saying in the chat. Picking a college is a collaborative process between parents and children. And mm -hmm. I think that really summarizes well. Uh, the importance and primacy really of the parent making the decision. You know, one of the things we always point out in business is the customer is the one who pays you. So technically, the customer of most yeah. of the universities are the parents, even though you think often you think it's the student or you, as a student, you think, well, it's here for me. It's really yeah. the vast majority of the time. Of course, a lot of younger people put themselves through school. So they are, interestingly, the customer. But the customer is the one who pays you. And one of the things that we talked about as we chatted a bit yesterday was um, why it costs so much. You have done research, you've kind of looked in and broken it down. You referenced it a little bit at the top, but let's go a little deeper now, Chris, based on what you've studied. Again, to most of us, it's opaque. It's just a number. It's $37,000 a year, and that may or may not include room and board. And it's not entirely clear to me as my child shows up that first day of campus, tries to get her classes, doesn't get two of the electives she was hoping to get. It's unclear to me why I'm paying and what and why it caught what I'm paying and why it costs that much. So thoughts back on this topic. Um, well, I could talk a lot about this, and, and depending on how how complex we want to make the discussion, but I would I would point I, I would I would point you and the listeners, David, back to that back to that college tour, and I would say, um, think about what they're pointing out on that college tour. Um, at no point during any college tour that you're ever going to go on are they going to say, you know, we saved um, we were going to build a new student center, but we realized the one we had was pretty good. And um, rather than um, building a new student center and taking out a 30 year bond on that and and adding, you know, um, seven hundred and forty dollars to every to, to, to the tuition of every student who attends this place. We ran the numbers. We figured we're going to do with a you know fairly mediocre student center, but we're going to save you some money. Right. That's never going to happen on any college tour. Right. They're going to point to their new. Um, student center, and they're going to point to their new climbing wall, and they're going to point to their new classrooms, and they're going to point to all the technology that they have, and they're going to say, they're going to talk about how, um, you know, their football team is competitive, and they're going to talk about the new stadium, and they're going to talk about all of these kinds of things. And I see one of your, um, one of your um, 
uh, uh, listeners, listeners is pointing out some Georgetown stuff. There is some good, there is some good uh, play, uh, 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 information at that Georgetown site. There is every reason, um, Howard Bowen who's a famous economist used to say, higher education institutions raise all the money they can and they spend all the money they raise. The, the business we're in, higher education is, you're not gonna run out of things to improve, right? Whether they are facilities, whether they are better faculty, whether they are student undergraduate research experiences, whether they, you know, the you know, Lord knows the football team new, needs new helmets, right? And um, uh, the, the, the higher education cost disease, as it's described in the literature, is very real. And um, so it is, um, it is the rare college president. Mitch Daniels did this at Purdue when he, when he was president at Purdue, who came in and said, we're going to freeze our tuition. That is a rare college president. And, and uh, Mitch Daniels was the former governor of Indiana. I think he did that because he knew just how politically powerful um, a, a flagship university saying, hey, we're not going to raise our tuition for the next 10 years or whatever they did at Purdue. Um, that's really rare. Um, and there's got to be a lot of pressure on an institution to do that because there's a, certainly a lot of uh, uh, incentive to, to spend more money on, on students. So when you look at that tuition, um, when you look at that price tag, and, and I think it's really important to remember that relatively few people pay that price tag. It is just a price tag. It's, it's the same... You can think about it as, um, you know, when you buy a new car. I don't think most people go in expecting to play, pay MSRP, right, on, on a car. Um, but there's no way to sort of translate or itemize or de-aggregate or unbundle that tuition um, cost and say, oh, you know, 32% of that's going for instruction and, um, and sort of rationalize it or make sense of it in that way. That's, that's not the way higher education is priced. That's really fascinating. And it's so different from the way most other products and services in our society mm -hmm. are priced. And so it's just worth remembering that as, again, as parents and kids, it's, it's a number. <laughs> no one's really sure why that number is that number. It's as high as that number can be in a lot of cases, although it takes guts to say, let's have it or let's freeze it. I think that's, that's really interesting. Chris, we are suckers here at The Motley Fool and at The Fool Foundation for people who go against conventional wisdom, people who look at the way the world acts and says, uh, say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this different thing. And especially mm -hmm. when they're right, we mm -hmm. love those people. And I feel like we have a fellow fool among us today that I'm getting to interview. Could you give me a couple examples of conventional wisdom uh, in higher ed, either within higher ed itself or observing it? conventional wisdom that you'd like to take a shot or two at and help us think a little bit smarter about. I'm opening it quite broadly here, but you know, Robert Frost on his gravestone, I had a lover's quarrel with the mm -hmm. world. And, yeah. uh, and it's a beautiful phrase. So I feel like you have a lover's quarrel with your industry. And I imagine you're kind of a gadfly. And when university presidents see you coming, they may start looking and walking the other <laughs> way. But could you, could you puncture a little bit of the conventional wisdom out there? Well, you know, I, I think I think higher education is in some ways a, a fairly traditional business, right? We the way we do things has has not changed that much. And and in some cases for for very good reasons. I think we actually do some things some things quite well. I think um uh some of the ways in which we um uh promote um, you know, a broad set of learning uh, uh, through the liberal arts curriculum. I think that's really a good idea. Um, but in terms of um, sort of conventional conventional wisdom and going against the grain, I think some of the things that we could think a little differently about are, um, you know, we've been very slow in higher education to think about um, Think about the fact that increasingly, particularly for um, a growing group of students, adult learners, um, who may be getting a master's degree or an advanced degree, um, we bring in um, we bring in a very diverse set of learners. They're diverse in their backgrounds. Maybe some of them have worked in a trade industry. Maybe some of them have worked have not been working for the last ten years. Maybe some of them have worked in a in a different profession and they're changing professions, right? Um, but they have different sets of skills. They know different things. They have different um, understanding of 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 math and English and writing skills and all these other kinds of th skills. And yet, um, we start them at the same spot and we um, and we put them through the same curriculum. And I think we've been uh, fairly slow to a, to a, to um, uh, 
uh, uh, think about um, you know a bespoke curriculum. Competence, competency-based education is another way of thinking about that. But how do we how do we customize, uh, particularly for uh, d the diverse learners who are coming to us? How do we customize a learning plan that meets people wh where they are and gets them to um, you know to the, to the goal line um, as efficiently? Um, and 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 as as customized as we possibly can, and I I think part of the reason we don't do that, um, quite frankly, is um, that would require us knowing what is that would require us knowing what knowledge and skills one needs to have at the finish line, and we're not good at that, right? So in, in order to design a customized learning plan and assess somebody sort of pre and post, you actually need to start out with okay, post, what do I want them to know? And we have not traditionally done a great job of, of that kind of assessment in higher education. Um, so I think that would be that would be one way. Um, that's some conventional wisdom that we haven't that we haven't adopted. I also think we've been fairly, um, you know, there's um, and this is, uh, you know, this comes from both uh, uh, higher education, but also from the public um, notions of what constitutes quality have 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 been um, fairly uniform and fairly um, uh, unsophisticated and based on inputs rather than outputs. So if you take a look at, um, you know, traditional ranking, U.S. News, uh, the Times of Higher Education, Times Higher Education in London just came out with their with their worldwide rankings today, um, oh. which was which was news on our campus. Um, we're 15, in case you're wondering. Uh -huh. um, and um, uh, what you see on a lot of those things um, traditionally, I think they've gotten slightly better, is a lot of input, right? Um, how selective is this institution? Um, what's their yield look like? What are the SAT scores of the students coming in? What are the class sizes, right? Um, these All these indicators that are really about, are they taking in quality inputs and do they have the resources necessary to, to uh, better educate those students who are coming in with quality inputs? Um, a better way, and you're starting to see a little bit more of this, is a more of a value-added approach, um, which is, you know, for the students who are coming in, um, let's take a look at what we would predict in terms of a graduation rate for those students based on uh, based on a set of of, of in inputs indicators, right? And let's say we we would predict that at institution X, um, maybe a public regional a regional public university, we would expect them to graduate um, forty six percent of their students in four years, but they actually graduate sixty five percent of their students in four years. Wow, that's that's really impressive, right? Um, that's somebody who said that's an institution that's that's taking in students and doing better um, than one would predict and producing an ROI for those students. And if you're a, a regional public university for the state, that is really impressive. Right. Um, yep. And that's something as we hear governors talk about, we want more uh, we want more um, residents with associate's degrees, with bachelor's degrees, with um, technological skills, with skills to you know take on the best jobs that are available. Um, you should that kind of institution should be rewarded um, by the state. Now, what's interesting about that is typically that institution is not the one awarded by the state. It's the it's the state public flagship that takes in sort of higher quality students that that is that is that is given resources that on a per student basis are actually higher than the institutions that are doing the two and the four year more of the remediation work. So um, I think those are a couple of things that you could point to as both in terms of how uh, education about uh, institutions operate, but also how they're funded and policies around edu higher education. Great, Chris. And you've spent a career looking at it. You, you've really looked at things that many others have not. You mentioned the, the research is fairly sparse in terms of how do colleges and universities market themselves, a lot of the mm -hmm. outcome as opposed to the input work. Um, mm -hmm. So you're you're in there looking at the edges and really kind of still on the bleeding edge when we talk about um is college worth it with the New York Times? Uh, we have a very rich chat going. Um, I, I don't want to be too distracted by it, but there's some great questions and points being made and links being put up by our community. So thank you for that. I'm going to start uh, flashing a few of these your way, Chris, because I really want to share these voices. I also want to prep you. We didn't talk about this ahead of time, but we play a game often when I interview. It's called Buy, Sell, or Hold. These aren't okay. stocks, though. These are things happening in our society. Okay. I'll be asking you in a little while, if they were stocks, would you be buying or selling or holding? Basically, how bullish are you? We're gonna. That's going to be the close of our, our discussion today. But let me go to Barbara Jolly, who asked this, Chris. She said, as a faculty member myself at a college of pharmacy, which is a doctoral program, there mm -hmm. are expenses for things like clinical rotations, labs, and similar required elements 
Barbara says, I always meet with my advisees in the early days of their first year to be sure they understand the total cost mm -hmm. of their degree. We talk about making good financial lifestyle decisions. Mm -hmm. Barbara continues, I'm frequently dismayed by how little they know about managing their lifestyle yeah. decisions on their long term term financial health. Her question, how do we improve the financial skills students have before they arrive on mm -hmm. campus? Well, Barbara sounds like a better advisor than than me. So, so I'm <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed already. We can all um, learn from each other. That's right. I'm, I'm sure if we had some advisee, my advisees online, they'd tell you the same thing. Um, you know, a couple of things there. One is um, I um, and and we're trying. We're actually trying to do this at my institution. We still got some some room to go, but the um, you know the the increasing tendency of institutions to charge tuition plus fees. I think adds to that opacity that we were talking about of that confusion. You know, what is the cost of college? Well, here's tuition, but actually you've got a tech fee, you've got a lab fee, you've got a clinical fee, you've got a, you know, whatever fee. And we would, we, we would be doing students um, and our, and our society a, a service if we, if we had a single price, right? Because we know students and, and, and built those kinds of things in. The challenge of course, is that um, it's just like anything else. When, um, you're 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 doing um, you're putting yourself at a at a pricing disadvantage in some ways, and the fact is some students won't take advantage of those services. So you're trying to you're trying to unbundle those things and cost those out. Um, Barbara's point is a real good one. I would I I, would, I am a strong advocate um, of, of financial literacy courses um, being taught in, in in as part of a K twelve curriculum. I think. I think we do, um, and higher education. Um, I think we do um, uh, ourselves a huge disservice by not spending um, a significant amount of time in a high school classroom, for example, talking about credit cards, talking about loans, talking about um, you know, talking about interest, talking about buying a car, you know, talking about buying a buying a you know buying a four year used car on a seven year note, that kind of thing, right? That's that you know that a lot of people seem to do, and we could take you through that and sort of explain. It's probably not a real good decision, right? So I think if we did that kind of thing, maybe um, students would be in a better position. Maybe their parents would be in a better decision to ask, um, you know, the hard questions around uh, around college pricing that that should be asked. Tom Luther pointing out the irony is the content of education is free today, and I'm thinking about things. I know you know these better than I do. Coursera, edX platforms that yep. basically take the actual learning and make yep. it seemingly free. Tom points out, yet the credential price has soared with the subsidy. The value of the credential signal, he asserts, has dropped. Your thoughts? Um, I would agree with everything until that last part, probably. I would say the um, the value of, I'm not sure that the value of the credential has dropped. And I think in some cases, the value of the credential is higher than ever. I think it depends on whose name's on the credential. Um, I think that that matters a lot. There's a, there's a great... Um, you know, there's a great range, a great continuum of sort of uh, of, of branding um, and, and credentialing in higher education and the value of that credential as a result. But I certainly do agree. One could one could get a pretty darn good higher education um, or K-12 or higher education going through Khan Academy and uh, some of the MOOCs that are available, um, MIT and the open course where they've put online. Um, you could sit at home in front of your computer and get a get a very high quality education in, in lots of ways. Now, I think you'd also miss out on a lot of other things that people are people people buy when they when they go to college, which is the entirety of the co-curriculum, right? Which I would point out for many students is the reason they choose their college, right? As opposed to the 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 primary curriculum that's that's going on in the classroom. And um, there's a lot of research suggesting that what goes on outside the classroom from a developmental perspective and to some degree from a learning perspective is often just as important or, or at least very important when it comes to, um, you know, uh, sort of appropriate learning and, and development. It's true. And, you know, I, I, I'm even thinking about um, remote learning or remote work these days. Mm -hmm. A lot of people um, trying to and in many cases successfully getting their jobs done this way, just talking to other people via Zoom yeah. like I am to you, Chris. And yet there is, it seems, some real value in being present with each other and having water cooler moments, having a dorm room. Sure. And, uh, and it's, it's hard to put a price on the value of human interaction. It's, it's really an interesting thing right now because it's, I think it's kind of being tested and we're mm -hmm. learning right now whether we, how much interaction we need or not. So uh, that's a little bit of a sidelight. I don't wanna go down that track, but 
Do you do you work remotely? Do do you find yeah. yourself working differently post COVID or? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, universities are not unlike the rest of the world. The pandemic has has changed us, and um, one of the ways in which changed us is um, we've adapted and adopted more. Um, more tech, technology and tools for teaching online. Um, a significant number of, stu of our students here at, at Hopkins and the School of Education uh, enroll online. Uh, we have entire programs that are available online. Uh, and we do our best in those programs. We employ uh, a lot of um, instructional designers and technologists and other support teams to make those um, experiences as rich um, and as robust as we possibly can. Um, uh, and I can tell you, just like... Um, uh, you know, commercial real estate in, in New York City and other kinds of places. Um, uh, we struggle sometimes to get people to come back to campus and we have to create, you know, we have to create reasons for people to want to be here, students, staff and faculty. And um, now I would say for for the undergraduate population, um, being on campus is is and has been, you know, the the coin of the realm. Um, and I don't think that's that's going to change. But I think for for graduate level programs, uh, you have to be very flexible and think about, you know, where your learners are and what the markets are. And uh, to some extent, um, people are uh, more and more students are demanding some kind of at least hybrid um, approach to to, to uh, an advanced degree. Chris, who's doing it right out there? Who impresses you either at a state level Mm -hmm. um, or if there are federal things we should be paying attention to or individual universities, who do you want to call out for doing hmm. something really well? Well, that's an interesting question to ask me. Um, put me on the spot there a little bit, uh, David. <laughs> I would say, you know, w one place that's gotten um, some pretty good press and I think has done uh, 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 has done some things um, that other universities are, are learning from is um, Georgia State University in uh, in Atlanta. And what they've what they've done is that's that's an institution I was talking earlier about. Uh, you know, that has been throughout most of its history. I don't know that I don't have the data in front of me, but a not a particularly selective university. Right. Um, they brought in they brought in certainly talented students, but they've also brought in students who probably are in need of a bit more um, uh, remediation. And what they've done is they put together through a very intentional process. Um, an assessment and evaluation of what of of what their students need um, from a academic side, from a co-curricular side, and they put it in place and modeled um, uh, modeled really how to um, uh, uh, improve retention and graduation rates and student learning that they can document in ways that um, very few other institutions have been able to sort of you know scale up and 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 make that jump in 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 that way. So I think that's that's one example of a place that I would I would I would point to and um, that has been able to do that. I think in, there's a, there's a couple of other places that have you know interesting models that I think are um, uh, uh, Berea College in Kentucky has been able to continue to offer um, a free higher education for students who attend there. Um, some of that's the benefit of a very large endowment, but some of it's been the benefit of a very um, innovative, you know, traditionally innovative approach um, to the way they, they've gone after they've gone after higher education. Um, so I think there are some places out there that are doing that are doing the right things when it comes to their students. There's a lot of community colleges that do an amazing job um, with an open enrollment um, uh, population. Uh, bringing in, um, you know, working with um, local companies, regional companies, doing just-in-time education, uh, improving, you know, skill sets very specifically for for jobs and for industry in those areas. Um, our community college system in the United States, in many ways, is is a, is a very high performer. And let's let's thank you, Chris. Those are great. I did not want to put you on the spot, or didn't mean to, but I knew you were totally worthy of it. And I, you know, I Hopkins was Hopkins does a great job too. I should point out. Sure. You know, I, I'm happy to talk to the home team here, but I, I think the exemplars is finding those that are doing it right and well that we can learn from is, is so important. And so I'm really glad that you shared that. I know so much of your work has been focused on the United States of America. We do have an international audience. People will sure. watch this video months from now wondering what you think internationally is going well. Who can the U.S. learn from? Obviously, there's a lot of free university out there. There are also many fewer universities out there often, as you pointed out. Many countries don't have as many as we do. So I'm curious yeah. who you'd like to point to as an exemplar. You know, it's, it's interesting. I think in some ways, um, one of the things that we could learn from other um, um, 
we've we've adopted a very market based, um, you know, um, um, may a thousand flowers bloom approach to to higher education traditionally, and that has been that has been very useful. I think as we moved into a from an elite into a, a mass higher education system, but one could make the argument that we've gone too far, and that one thing that the uh, um, one thing that many other countries have been able to do. Um, uh, perhaps better than us um, is is not engaged in such a proliferation of institutions. I mentioned we have four thousand um, uh, uh, two and four year colleges in the United States, and one could look at the performance of many of those schools and say, hmm, should we really be subsidizing those schools with with um, you know student loans and Pell grants and uh, GI uh, GI Bill uh, dollars, right? Um, and I think there's an argument to be made that we we shouldn't be. Um, we have um, we, we, if you look at, um, you know, other OECD countries, for example, um, which is the sort of, you know, Western um, high performing uh, economies of the world, um, I think the bottom of our system um, performs uh, significantly worse than the bottom of their system. Um, they have um, the top of our system. Um, it's not unlike our healthcare system, right? If you if if you have money, our healthcare system's great. Um, if you have access, our higher education system's great. If you're well prepared, if you have you know money to pay tuition, or if you're lucky enough to be um, good enough um, academically to get into an elite institution, and you don't have the money, you're still in a good situation. Um, but for the vast majority of students in our system, they have to sort of choose amongst the non-elite institutions. And um, there are winners and losers in our in our non-elites and our and our, um, among our non-elites. And I think there tend to be um, there tends to be less um, less range, particularly on the bottom, in in other OECD uh, higher education systems. Thank you for that, Chris. Um... So we're going to get to buy, sell, hold very shortly, and we're going to be finishing before the end of the hour because that's what we do. We know Chris's time is important. You, dear <laughs> viewer, your time is important, too. We always finish early. Don't you love us? All right. But with that said, I still have one or two more questions before buy, sell, or hold, inspired, of course, by the wonderful conversation I'm seeing in the webinar chat. Um, Chris, do the numbers add up? Play this system forward from 2023. Mm -hmm. um, will community colleges survive in the U.S.? Uh, will there be uh, a, a, some huge shift because the finances just didn't work by the year 2038? I'd love to hear yeah. a future prediction or two from you. Okay. Um, well, I'll start off by saying almost all predictions on higher education have been wrong, uh, even <laughs> those made by experts. I'll, I'll start with that, right? Um, Love it. You know, there, there was a book written, I think, in 1973 by two scholars, Aston and Lee, about higher education. They, and they looked at, they looked at um, you know, this was sort of post baby, baby boom, uh, GI Bill, 1973. And they looked at the higher education landscape. They looked at demographic trends and they said, wow, um, uh, we're, we're predicting that 500 institutions are going to go under in the next decade or so. Turns out, no, not so much. Uh, what happened was those institutions that were serving undergrads, um, rather than um, rather than when realizing they couldn't recruit enough undergrads, started master's degree programs, right? Or started, or if they were located in um, the middle of Kansas and the population um, was not in, was not there anymore in the middle of Kansas. They started up a satellite campus in Wichita or in Kansas City, right? So institutions adapted, and they will continue to adapt with online programs, with satellite campuses, with new programs that reach new audiences, and all those kind of things. So it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in higher education, and most everybody has been wrong. That said, we are seeing a demographic cliff in higher education, particularly in um, the Rust Belt and in the Midwest, Northeast. And there are not as many high school graduates in, in many states as there were, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And that is the meat and potatoes for higher education. So um, it is reasonable to think that some of the institutions that are uh, challenged right now in terms of um, admissions and yield and you know, bringing in enough students to make things work, it is reasonable to think that some of those places are not going to be around. Um, I, we had an influx of money into the system um, from the federal government during during COVID. Um, we're starting to see institutions having eaten their way through that, um, trying to figure out what's next for revenues for them. And, and it's clearly not tuition if they can't draw enough students. So we already started to see a failure rate that is a little higher um, than we saw, you know, maybe 10 years ago, maybe significantly higher. I haven't seen I haven't seen numbers on this lately, but um, the failure rate is higher. Um, I do think that for the institutions, 
So for the institutions at the sort of uh, at the at the at the bottom of this of the system in terms of resources, in terms of um, access to uh, students and and tuition dollars, I think it's going to be a really tough road to hoe um, over the next um, decade or so. And um, the, the, that that demographic cliff is is going to hurt them. I do think we're going to reach a point here on pricing. Um, people keep predicting this that it, where um, people aren't aren't going to be willing where the price tag is going to become problematic. Right. Um, I don't think that's true for the um, for the Williams College and Amherst College and perhaps the Johns Hopkins of the world. Um, it, perhaps it's less true. Um, but but price tag matters. And you you know these articles you're seeing about is higher education worth it. I would also point out you saw if you went back to 1975, you'd see the same article in Time and Newsweek in 1975. Is higher education worth it? People huh. have been asking that question for 45, 50 years. So it's not a new question. But I think the the the, the frequency with which it's being asked suggests that there is some tension here between um, what colleges are producing and how they're pricing themselves and the utility of, 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 of how their communities see them. Thank you for that. Okay, Chris. Well, I've, um, we're just about getting ready for a few buy, sell, or holds. I do want to say, uh, just as a quick aside, first of all, thank you for everybody who joined us this hour and for the many who will watch this after the live hour that we did. This is our Spark series for the Motley Fool Foundation. We do this once a month. We have brilliant people like Chris Morphew or last, last month, Dan Pink, come in and share their viewpoints. And you know, we believe that there are five key factors that lead to financial freedom. It's not just... Uh, having money. <laughs> it's having your health. It's having a roof over your head. It's having it's having work. And in addition to money, the fifth one is, of course, education, which is our topic this month. And we have um, we have a genius who's helping us think through and helping giving us advice as parents or people uh, living through the society at a at a macro level and a micro level. Chris, you've really spoken so ably and helpfully to us. So thank you very much. And let's play buy, sell, or hold here in our last few minutes. Yeah. Uh, so again, these are not stocks, but if they were stocks, would you be buying, sell, or, selling, or holding today? And a few sentences, a minute or two as to why. And I have three for you right off the top of my head. The first one is SATs. If SATs, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, I think that's the acronym. If they were a stock, if that whole system were a stock today, are you buying, selling, or holding? Uh, you're asking, by the way, someone who's never sold a stock in his life. I've only bought stocks, so um, and which, I love that. I didn't I, know I, that I, I knew I, I, I knew you would. So I'm Fantastic. I'm fairly fairly conservative about these. So things. foolish. You could um, you could think about this as you know, would you invest money in the College Board right now in terms of the products that they're offering? Right. Uh, I, I I I wouldn't be buying right now. I, I wouldn't be buying, and you know, I'm I'm an Iowan. I come from ACT land, and you know, uh, Iowa City, Iowa is where ACT is invented. Um, I think it's a struggle right now for testing organizations. Um, I think they need to figure out ways to prove um, prove that they really add value to the system. And as more and more institutions say, um, go test optional. As more and more students say, well, if you're test optional, I'm only going to send you my tests if they're incredible. Right? <laughs> I'm not going to send them to you if they're bad. Um, I think I think it's um, at best a hold at this point. Thank you. Next one up, the Biden effort to forgive student debt, buy, mm. sell or hold. Oh, you're uh, I tell you, I'm not going to I'm not going to make there, there are going to be some people that disagree with me on this one. I, I, I am not a fan and I'm not a fan because it because it's dealing with the symptom. It's not dealing with the problem. If you really want to help people with student debt, um, we should stop. Um, we should stop incentivizing people taking out debt um, for uh, to attend colleges where they have a very low likelihood of graduating. Mm. Right. I think that's what we should do. And and um, then if 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 the if the trillion dollars of debt was held only among um, people who graduated from college and could achieve an ROI with their education, right, and it was a reasonable level of debt. That would be fine, right? The debt problem is, to some degree, a function of the choices uh, that uh, that that students are making, and those choices are driven by an opaque market, and they're driven by, in some cases, institutions that are poor performers. So, um, I'm I'm a hold at best. <laughs> yep, and I appreciate that, and thank you for taking on everything I'm asking. The tough <laughs> ones and the easy ones. Are there any easy ones? The next one up. Maybe this is easier. If this were a stock. Buy, sell, or hold the U.S. News and World Report college rankings. <laughs> uh, 
Um, now, I think I, I have a personal interest here as well. Um, you know, to some degree, it's like testing. I think the, I think it's becoming um, there's more competitors than ever. I think um, the veracity of of what they're reporting is being challenged more and more, not just because it's not clear that they do their homework, but it's also not clear that uh, the institutions that are sending in their data are actually sending in the correct data, right? Um, so they don't audit the data. Um, institutions send in bad data. There are more competitors than ever. People are wondering whether their their indicators are the right indicators and really questioning this. Uh, law schools and medical schools are pulling out. Undergraduate institutions are pulling it out. Uh, probably a sell. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're right near the end now. Um, but I guess I have to add a fourth one in because it's all the buzz. It's 2023. I'll just open it up. As wide as possible, artificial intelligence, Chris, buy, mm. sell, or hold. I don't think it, I, I, at this point, I don't think it matters if we buy, sell, or hold. I think it's coming, right? Um, <laughs> I, you know, what's funny is I just, um, I just came back from a, a symposium on on artificial intelligence, machine learning that the the university is the ran today, and um, you know we're we're going to be we're going to be investing in 110 new faculty members in um, data science and machine learning and AI and applied math and um, uh, I think everybody that I talk to uh, who knows a lot about this suggests that um, first of all it's already here right AI is already here and in, in, in forms that we might not recognize but you know patterns of learning and applying those and a lot, uh, applying those what we know about patterns to you know to tools that's already here so I think I'm I have to be a buy on that. Well, I am delighted to have spent this hour, all of us together, but especially with our esteemed guest. He's the Dean of the School of Education at Johns Hopkins University. That that was his title and has been so for a while, but only as of today can we update it and say the number 15 academic institution ranked globally as of today. <laughs> so I know you, you want to get in the top 10 next though, right? I mean, uh, you can yeah. never settle. I, I say I'm a sell on rankings and then I cite our rankings. It's <laughs> it's it, it's pathetic, David. It really is. I'm great at speaking out both sides of my mouth too. Actually, it shows that you have a well integrated <laughs> bullish and bear side to you. And uh and and you also have a great sense of humor. And I'm delighted to know that you are what we would call a highly capital F foolish investor, buying, 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 not selling, mm. buying. That's that's really a wonderful way to financial freedom, which is at the heart of the Motley Fool Foundation and uh, underlay a lot of our conversation. Well, it, it has to work that way, David, because I tell you the first stock, the first two stocks I ever bought were Cisco and Microsoft, which sounds great, except that I bought them in March of 2000. Okay, <laughs> so um, you can imagine, you can imagine I better hold on to those for a while. Well, and, and indeed Microsoft has been an excellent <laughs> hold. So congratulations, Chris. Well, I wanna thank everybody for the gift of your time. You, you, you it's, it's noon. Well. Not if you're in Uganda. Thank you for joining us at night. But for a lot of us, it's a busy time of year. And Chris, I know it is for you. You have something at one at 2 p.m. sharp. So we're going to end it right here. Chris Morphew, thank you so much for joining with us and helping educate us on education, specifically higher education, with your very helpful viewpoints, whether the micro help the parents need or the macro, the help that our society needs. You're on it. And thank you. All right. Thanks, David. I enjoyed it. All right. Cheers. Good afternoon. Bye -bye. Yes. Happy September, everybody. So long.